In addition to the efforts to attract foreign investment, the article also underscores the alarming unemployment situation in China. Data from the National Immigration Administration shows a 15% decrease in the issuance of various types of residence permits to foreigners compared to pre-pandemic levels last year, along with a significant drop by two-thirds in the number of short-term tourists, including business travelers, during the same period. I'm currently at Beijing Capital International Airport. It's evening at the T3 International Departures Area, and basically all the shops are closed. You can't even find a place to eat noodles, only a Costa, a Starbucks, and a duty-free shop are open. There are very few people, it's indeed quite bleak. It reminds me of many friends who have contacted me, saying that the economic situation here is not good. You see, this year's business situation isn't just about how hard you work. Even if you put in all your effort, you still might not make money. Look at the streets, cleaner than a dog licks. You might have the drive to work hard but there's nowhere to apply it. Business in recent years hasn't been as good as during the pandemic, slightly better. To be honest, for supermarket owners like us during those pandemic years, business was all right. We thought, once the pandemic ends, maybe 2023 will be better. But 2023 turned out worse than the pandemic period. And what's even more surprising is that 2024 is worse than 2023. I don't know if you feel the same, but it's deeply felt. You know? Have you noticed fewer people on the streets after each holiday? With a population of 1.4 billion, if you go out now, you'll see fewer and fewer people. The physical condition of the economy is really tough. There are various reasons, empty pockets, no money, low wages, difficulty finding jobs in all sectors, pressures from mortgages, car loans, and, uh, the rise of online shopping, community buying, and various platforms. This has made it really hard for physical stores to survive. Following the usual practice, the first important political event for China's premier after the two sessions is the development forum held at the end of March, where he meets with CEOs of major multinational companies. Last Tuesday, Reuters learned that, similar to not holding press conferences after the two sessions, Li Cheng announced early that he would not meet with these business elites. This caused quite a stir in the overseas news community. Early yesterday morning, the Wall Street Journal published a lengthy article, analyzing who would meet with the CEOs at the forum. By noon, the Wall Street Journal, which is always well informed about internal Chinese politics, broke an exclusive news story that this time, Xi Jinping himself will personally direct and deploy, bare-chested, to meet with CEOs, using his personal charm and authority to attract foreign investors and stabilize foreign capital. As the owner of a small shop, I'm seeing some issues in the market. People aren't spending much, and they're nowhere to be found. Today, our sales were only 500 yuan, and I even exchanged 200 yuan in cash. Finally, someone came in, another liquor salesman. I explained that my rural shop doesn't sell much liquor, so he should try the supermarket next door. He replied, they've sold out. Haven't moved anything since unloading before the new year haven't even unpacked a single item. Might have to skip lunch. I advised him not to run around so much since there's no shortage of goods in the market, wasting fuel. He said, nowadays, even though goods aren't selling, manufacturers still have quotas to meet, and they can't guarantee their basic salary. It's true. This year's situation is unusual. When I went to the wholesale market this morning, it was eerily quiet. The wholesalers mentioned there weren't many purchases today. Just after the new year, things really aren't selling. Have you noticed a problem? Business at the beginning of this year has been particularly poor, and this is not just reflected in our direct distributors. Inside the factories, I went to our country's largest production area, Gowan, yesterday, and so far, the production rate hasn't been very high. The main reason is that the customers' warehouses are full of goods, while the distributors at the end of the chain are struggling. The information I received is that a warehouse with a dozen or so people might have sales of over 10,000 yuan on a good day, but on bad days, they might not even reach 10,000. Some factories have already started bargaining on prices for the middlemen. What could be the reason for this? In my opinion, firstly, many people believe that there's a shortage of land this year, so there's been a decrease in construction activity. Secondly, the overall economy is still in the process of recovery. What do you think? Youth unemployment issue in China is becoming increasingly severe, with many highly educated young people struggling to find desirable positions. Consequently, many are turning their attention to civil service jobs. Recently, 25 provinces in China have opened registrations for civil service exams. 
According to official data released, the number of people participating in civil service exams this year has reached 5.67 million. A few days ago, I fell for a scam again. I got an internship nearby because it was convenient for me. Though the pay wasn't great, I took it to finish my internship quickly. I worked there for three days, and last night, they told me to quit without paying. They said the first three days were unpaid probation, but during the interview, they assured me there wasn't any probation period, once hired, it was confirmed. I sensed something was off right from the start. The company had interviews daily, but never hired anyone. Later, I realized it wasn't a proper company, but more like a casual dance training place. Worried it might not be legit, I recorded customer inquiries as they often badmouth them behind their backs. On my resignation night, when they didn't pay and blocked me, I took action. I reported them for unpaid wages, and it worked, they paid me immediately. Standing up for yourself is key, you need to be firm for them to listen. They threatened me afterward, but I remained calm, reminding them I had evidence. The defamation lawsuit process would take time, maybe a year, before they received any summons. I also warned them that once I got the summons, I'd make all evidence public. I wished them luck, and they went silent. As of now, I've successfully defended my rights. According to the Wall Street Journal's exclusive report, Chinese President Xi Jinping plans to meet with a group of American business leaders next week after a government-hosted forum. With the backdrop of outflows of foreign capital, the Chinese government is intensifying efforts to attract American companies. Informed sources say that the meeting with China's top leaders is scheduled for next Wednesday. Evan Greenberg, CEO of insurance company AIG, Stephen Orlands, President of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, and Craig Allen, President of the U.S.-China Business Council, are expected to attend. The list of attendees is still being finalized. Informed sources say that the Chinese government may also cancel Xi Jinping's meeting at the last minute. Last March, only 23 business leaders from American companies attended the meeting. This year, it is expected that over 85 executives will attend, with 34 coming from American multinational companies. Expected attendees include CEOs such as Tim Cook of Apple, Stephen Schwartzman of Blackstone Group, Ken Griffin of Hedge Fund Citadel, and Noel Quinn of HSBC Holdings. Li Chang stepped aside, and President Xi personally took the stage, which can be interpreted as Xi Jinping once again declaring to the outside world that he is the sole decision-maker in China. However, another dilemma that cannot be ignored is that since last year, there has been a gradual withdrawal of foreign capital. Despite China unilaterally lifting visa restrictions on multiple countries, it has not only failed to attract a wave of foreigners entering the country but also seen a gradual disappearance of foreigners who were originally in the country. Perhaps Xi Jinping is truly anxious. The title of an article in the Wall Street Journal is China attempts to attract foreigners back, but the halo of the past has faded away. The report states that to break free from years of isolation due to the pandemic, the Chinese government is launching a charm offensive in hopes of attracting foreigners back. However, the current wave of charm offensive by the CCP may be more difficult to succeed. In recent months, China has simplified visa procedures for business travelers and tourists, reduced visa fees, and even implemented visa waivers for some countries. China has also continued its preferential tax policies to enhance the attractiveness of living in China for foreign nationals. Premier Li Keqiang promised earlier this month at the National People's Congress to take more measures to re-establish the Invest in China brand. With Xi Jinping prioritizing security, the Chinese government severed ties with other countries during the pandemic. However, this recent charm offensive indicates that China is striving to restore its connections with countries worldwide. Nowadays, China is trying to reattract foreigners to return, but times have changed. Not only is the domestic economy slowing down, but the government is also tightening its control over society. In Washington, more and more people are skeptical about dealing with China. Influenced by China's dynamic zero-tolerance policy and nationwide anti-spying campaign, distrust of the Chinese government persists. A U.S. corporate executive said that an incident in mid-2023 made him uneasy. One evening, nine policemen appeared at his doorstep in Beijing, demanding to check his passport and confirm his employer. One of the policemen even used a smartphone to record the interaction between them. These policemen did not explain why they appeared at his doorstep. The executive said, it will take a long time to restore the trust that has been damaged in recent years. You must be careful if you want to travel in China. The fact that there are so many scams in China. Have you read the news?
let me share my first-hand experience, which aligns with the reported incident. A tourist diving in Sanya was asked by the instructor if he wanted to pay for photos. He declined, but the instructor forcefully removed his mask underwater, nearly causing him to drown. Similarly, during my dive in Sanya, the instructor pressured me to pay extra for a full face mask. Upon refusal, he abruptly pushed me underwater, resulting in me swallowing a large amount of seawater. Feeling frustrated, I eventually agreed to pay extra to stop the ordeal. Subsequently, the instructor demanded even more money for photos, totaling an additional 600 yuan. The water was murky, and the photos turned out terribly. In summary, my diving experience in Sanya was extremely disappointing, and I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. The speaker reflects on the irony of being in a hotel after spending a considerable amount of money yet still feeling dissatisfied. They express sympathy for someone else's plight, contrasting their own situation with that of another person or group. There's also mention of participating in a shopping tour and observing others' behavior, highlighting differences in attitude and experience. Now at the airport in Wuhan, these scammers are everywhere, especially numerous. They're con artists, dressing and appearing just like airline staff. In reality, they're from a credit card company. This practice has disappeared elsewhere, but in Wuhan, there are still many. Yesterday, while I was in Shaolu village, located in Huashi County, Hunan province, I accidentally collided with a tree and were asked to pay 2,000 yuan in compensation. We found ourselves unable to leave as we were blocked by others. Even after offering compensation, they insisted on detaining us. They instructed us not to remain in our vehicle and suggested we find alternative transportation, such as taking a bus. We promptly reported the incident to the police and underwent insurance procedures for three hours. Upon the arrival of law enforcement to document the scene, they directed us to the police station with assurances of resolution within 24 hours. However, nearing midnight, they claimed to be overwhelmed and requested our return at 8 a.m. the following morning. Upon our return, we provided our statements, only to be informed that an additional 10 working days would be required for further investigation. As non-locals with plans to depart for Hangzhou in just two days, a distance of over 800 kilometers away, it is impractical for us to return. Are there any nearby acquaintances who could lend us assistance? We are prepared to issue a power of attorney. Your aid would be greatly appreciated. According to data from the National Immigration Administration, China issued various types of residence permits to foreigners 711,000 times last year, a 15% decrease from before the pandemic in 2019. The number of short-term tourists, including business travelers, saw an even larger decrease, dropping by two-thirds during the same period. The challenges facing Shanghai are particularly evident. As a financial center, Shanghai used to be a vibrant city that attracted people from all walks of life. Official data shows that the number of new work permits for foreigners in Shanghai decreased from about 70,000 in 2020 to 50,000 in 2022. Graham Allen, an Irishman who runs an Irish-style pub in Shanghai, said, When we go to restaurants and malls on weekends, usually, I'm the only white person there. By the end of March this year, the number of round-trip flights between China and the United States may increase from the current 35 to 50. However, diplomats and business consultants say that even with a substantial increase in flights, it cannot solve fundamental changes. It is these fundamental changes that have led to a decline in foreign interest in China. Nowadays, many multinational companies are beginning to relocate their businesses outside of China to diversify. Cameron Johnson, a supply chain consultant in Shanghai, said, If you're a foreigner with a family and want to develop your career, you no longer need to stay in China because your destination is now Southeast Asia, India, or the Middle East. People leave, and money follows. The Ministry of Commerce of China stated in January that the actual use of foreign capital in China last year decreased by 8% compared to the previous year, to about $157 billion, marking the first decline in 10 years. China is increasingly seen as a source of risk. Sean Stein, a senior consultant providing advice to companies on regulatory and legal risks, said, In the past, there were many opportunities in China, and ambitious executives competed to come to China. Now, people don't see the benefits of coming to China. In certain regions of China, the housing market is undergoing a tumultuous nosedive, provoking intense frustration among its populace. Renowned investor Li Kaohsiung's decision to offload Shanghai properties at a jaw-dropping 80% discount epitomizes the severity of the situation.
In Shanghai's Iron Triangle, encompassing the Outer Ring Road and the Shanghai Minhung Elevated Expressway, property prices have plunged from 140,000 yuan per square meter to a meager 51,000 yuan, reverting to levels not seen since five years ago. Simultaneously, the astronomical surge in healthcare insurance premiums, 38 times the previous rate, and the stagnant wages, which have merely doubled over two decades, have forced nearly 40 million individuals to abandon insurance payments. It's an alarming indication of the dire financial straits faced by ordinary citizens. Housing prices plunge in many Chinese cities, from $22,000 to $8,000 per square meter. According to a report by First Financial on March 19, the real estate sector is still experiencing setbacks. Presently, there are 58 real estate firms listed on the Shanghai and Shenzhen stock exchanges, which have issued performance projections. Out of these, 43 companies anticipate incurring non-recurring net losses for the previous year, ranging from around $8.79 billion to $11.76 billion. When considering real estate companies listed in Hong Kong as well, the cumulative loss disclosed by these firms surpasses $150 billion. In Shanghai, the housing prices in Shanghai are currently declining, with Minhang being hit particularly hard. This area, enclosed by the Middle Ring Road, Outer Ring Road, and the Shanghai Minhang Elevated Expressway, belongs to the Minhang District. Especially around Meilong Town, near the Outer Ring Road subway station of Line 1, the prices in Luoyang New Village have plummeted the most, directly back to the levels of 2016. I don't know if buying a house brings you joy or sorrow? For me, it brings immense sorrow. Without a future here, I won't be the owner anymore. This house was the first one I bought in my life, and now I'm selling it myself. I feel very reluctant, truly reluctant. I don't want to pay the mortgage anymore, I don't want to put too much pressure on myself. In Guangdong, the situation is dire. Countless regular folks are grappling with substantial losses on their properties as prices plummet. For instance, a Seaview apartment in Huizhou, once valued at around 900,000 yuan, is now fetching just over 300,000 yuan, marking an astonishing 60% loss. Similarly, properties in the Dewan Center, previously priced at 12,300 yuan per square meter in 2021, are now being sold for just over 6,000 yuan, resulting in a significant halving of prices. Whether you're a property developer or an investor, drastic price reductions are now an unavoidable reality if you wish to make a sale. In Anhui, the house in Hefei has finally been sold unexpectedly quickly. The first house of my life resulted in a loss of nearly 300,000 yuan, which for us ordinary people, feels like our hearts are bleeding, it's really too painful. The reason for selling the house is due to a decrease in income and the immense pressure of mortgage payments. Paying 5,000 yuan per month for 30 years was too much. We didn't buy a house in Ningbo at that time because we didn't have enough down payment. From 2021, when we bought this house, until now, we have only visited twice. The cost of this mistaken choice is truly immense. After working hard and renting in Ningbo for over 10 years, it's all gone now. We can only accept reality and start over from scratch. There will be no more mortgages in the future, no more paying interest to the bank. Mortgages are terrifying. Thinking about it makes me feel incredibly relieved. From now on, if we have money, we'll buy in full, if not, we won't buy at all. We'll never use loans to buy a house prematurely again. We'll live within our means. Life is short, why burden ourselves with such pressure? We'll live according to our means. Different circles have different ways of living. From March 15 to March 17, the Shanghai Upscale Domain, located in the central ring of Shanghai, held the final round of pre-sale activities for its remaining units, including two additional units offered temporarily, totaling about 75 units with a combined value of approximately $125.2 million USD. The upscale domain is a mid-to-high-end property development by Chung Kong Property Holdings, a real estate company under Li Ka-shing's control. 
In contrast, according to disclosures from real estate agencies, there were over 480 groups of potential buyers participating in this round of pre-sales. This means that the number of potential buyers exceeds the number of available units by six times, making a lottery inevitable. Recently, reporters from 21st Century Business Herald visited the sales office of the upscale domain to witness the buzz and excitement in the current Shanghai property market. Due to the large number of visitors, a barrier was set up at the entrance of the sales office, manned by several staff members in black work uniforms, while dozens of real estate agents gathered outside the barrier. What direction will the Shanghai new property market take? What is the actual situation regarding the highly anticipated upscale domain project? According to information released by Shanghai, the first batch of new houses introduced this year totaled 4,335 units, the second batch had 4,632 units, and the third batch had 5,216 units. Due to the large supply and homogeneity of products, there is naturally considerable sales pressure. Recently, high-end projects with longer inventory turnover cycles have entered the market, adding to the pressure felt by real estate developers. In early March, Shanghai announced the release of the third batch of new houses. Among them, six projects had average prices exceeding $17,200 per square meter, with three projects breaking the $26,645 per square meter mark, representing a more than 4% increase from the highest average price of $25,400 per square meter in the second batch. Among them, the average price of the Binjiang Triumphal Arch was almost $27,000 per square meter, Zhonghai Shanchang Jioli was $26,785 per square meter, and Xiadu Felicity 268 was $26,645 per square meter. According to statistics, there were 888 units of new houses in the third batch with total prices exceeding $3.9 million, the highest number in a single batch in the past three years. An analyst pointed out that there is a significant difference in the speed of product development between Hong Kong-funded enterprises and mainland enterprises. Mainland real estate developers, especially private ones, are more accustomed to a high-leverage high-turnover development model, which carries higher risks. Hong Kong-funded real estate developers, who have experienced several cycles of fluctuation, tend to have lower leverage ratios and longer product development cycles, especially from land acquisition to commencement of construction. The development cycle of this land plot, from land acquisition to delivery, has also been relatively long. The Metropolis Hyatt Hotel opened in 2022. In December 2023, the commercial part of the project, Love Metropolis Shopping Mall, opened. As for the residential part, calculated from 2007, the expiration period of the last batch of homebuyers' property certificates has been 16 years. Once the residential part of the project is sold out, Li Kaoxing will have no other residential projects for sale in Shanghai, and after the previous sales, he only holds partial commercial properties. In recent years, the mainland real estate market has entered a period of adjustment. Many real estate companies have slowed their expansion pace due to liquidity crises. Hong Kong-funded real estate companies, once important participants in the mainland property market, have also slowed down their development pace. An analyst told 21st Century Business Herald that Hong Kong-funded real estate companies have always been risk-averse, and Li Kaoxing is particularly sensitive to investments. In the current market environment, a contraction in investment is not unexpected. Currently, there are still many Hong Kong-funded real estate companies with projects under construction or for sale in Shanghai, such as Shueon Land Limited, Sun Hung Kai Properties, Kerry Properties, Swire Properties, Hong Kong Land, and K. Wa International Holdings. However, they have moved away from the mainstream land auction market, focusing more on developing projects with existing stocks, mostly acquired in earlier years. The project types are mostly commercial complexes or urban renewal projects, with generally longer development cycles. Furthermore, the plight extends to construction workers and migrant laborers, who are feeling the brunt of the downturn as construction projects dwindle. Once enjoying lucrative wages, these workers now find themselves grappling with the harsh reality of unemployment. Adding to the grim picture, numerous manufacturing facilities are downsizing their operations due to plummeting orders, with some opting to relocate to Southeast Asia in pursuit of cheaper labor. The landscape of 2024 is bleak, with myriad challenges plaguing various sectors.
It's staggering to witness how numerous large corporations are downsizing their workforce or implementing salary cuts, while smaller enterprises teeter on the edge of insolvency. Those businesses that struggled to scrape by last year now find themselves incurring substantial losses. Even renowned brands like Starbucks, Luckin Coffee, and KFC are grappling with an influx of middle-aged individuals feigning employment. In the real estate arena, both upstream and downstream segments are reeling, with unsold properties haunting the market. Over 40 million Chinese abandoned insurance, with rural medical coverage doubling in 20 years. Over the past 20 years, the nearly 40-fold increase, from 1 US dollar and 54 cents to 58 US dollars and 46 cents, in medical insurance premiums has rendered it unaffordable for the Chinese populace and migrant workers. This policy, which seems to extract blood from the people to sustain the lives of the elite, coupled with the unfair distribution of medical insurance benefits, has shattered the public's confidence in the system. Furthermore, media investigations have found that the final straw breaking the public's trust in medical insurance is its inherent unfairness. The root of this distrust primarily lies in the allocation of funds within the medical insurance system, where ordinary individuals facing major illnesses still need to pay additional expenses out of pocket, while medicines in elite hospital wards are fully reimbursed. This exploitation of grassroots individuals to sustain the lives of the elite has left the general populace deeply aggrieved. Take the case of 49-year-old Lao Wang, a typical migrant worker who moved to the city in search of work. In a documentary titled Working Like This for 30 Years, which just premiered on NetEase News and depicts the living conditions of China's lower-class citizens, he faces the camera and points to a text message on his phone, saying that because he didn't earn any money last month, he can't even afford the 58 US dollars medical insurance premium. However, just a day after the documentary was released, it was promptly taken down by the authorities. Nevertheless, it's hard to ignore the fact that individuals like Lao Wang, unable to afford medical insurance, are not isolated cases in China. Didn't I not earn any money last month? They asked me to pay for medical insurance, but I haven't paid yet. Isn't it 380 yuan? They sent this message asking for payment. I still haven't found any work. For example, we know from statistics that there are probably over 600 million people in China earning less than 1,000 yuan per month. So for an elderly person who needs medical services even more, if they don't work in rural areas, they might receive less than 200 yuan in pension subsidies each month. So, we can compare a bit and understand that for them, the 380 yuan, 58 US dollars and 46 cents, annual deductible is actually quite burdensome. According to official Chinese statistics, in the past five years, over 40 million people in China have abandoned their insurance coverage. Rural medical insurance has increased 38-fold over 20 years and 6-fold over the past decade alone, skyrocketing from an initial 10 yuan to 58 US dollars and 50 cents. However, while people's income levels have risen by less than twofold, ordinary citizens truly cannot afford it. In the past year alone, 25 million people have opted out of insurance coverage. Don't be fooled by the seemingly modest sum of 58 US dollars and 50 cents. It's important to understand that for a rural family of five, this translates to about 290 US dollars annually. According to economic statistics, currently, there are still 600 million people in China with a monthly income of less than 153 US dollars. For them, this amount of money is indeed significant. Wang Zhangqi, deputy researcher at the National Security Research Institute of the Academy of Military Science, who has long studied China's social security, analyzed that while 58 US dollars and 50 cents may not seem like much, its significance changes when placed in the context of the entire rural income. Many individuals feel they are paying into a system from which they never benefit. Essential medications are often unavailable in rural medical facilities, forcing people to pay out of pocket at pharmacies. Moreover, the requirement to pay annually, with coverage lapsing if not renewed each year, makes people feel like their contributions are wasted. This situation has led to widespread disillusionment with the system. To prevent people from dropping out of the medical insurance scheme, the Chinese Communist Party resorts to various tactics including using children and household registration as leverage. Whether individuals cannot afford the premiums or choose not to pay them, the government perceives it as a threat. 
In 2022 alone, an estimated 25 million people withdrew from the program, prompting the authorities to take both soft and hard measures, including setting quotas for village cadres and offering them a 5% commission for each person enrolled. Recent reports from the Beijing Youth Daily have sparked public attention. Chat screenshots from the Tsauga Village Information Group warn villagers that failure to pay insurance premiums by the 25th of the month will affect their children's future prospects, suggesting that they may face obstacles in passing the political review required for civil service exams. What should be a basic healthcare safeguard for the people has become a tool of social control for local governments. Depending on the targets, medical insurance can paradoxically serve as a means of social control for local authorities. For instance, in Shandong, the local government collects fees for using water from the Yellow River for irrigation. Refusal to pay may result in the cancellation of medical insurance benefits. Moreover, those involved in rights activism or released from prison are often subjected to harsh measures, including withholding or deducting social security benefits, to ensure compliance. In China, the workforce is facing unprecedented challenges amidst a steep economic downturn, resulting in slashed wages, widespread job losses, soaring unemployment rates, and a surge in poverty. These hardships are not confined to the unskilled labor force, even the middle class is grappling with financial instability. The distressing sight of migrant workers, once gainfully employed, now relegated to sleeping rough on urban streets, has become a distressingly common occurrence. Furthermore, poignant tales of intellectuals and middle-class citizens facing bankruptcy, compelled to sell their homes due to job losses or drastic pay cuts, are stirring deep concerns across the nation. Social media platforms are abuzz with discussions surrounding this pressing issue. Do you guys feel like we're back to the era of $484 monthly wages from 10 years ago? In third-tier small cities, the average salary is just over $400, with many not even reaching that amount. Some jobs don't even offer the basic five social insurance and one housing fund benefits. Despite searching the entire city, they couldn't find many jobs that provide these benefits. The current job market has specific preferences and restrictions, they avoid candidates with low qualifications, no experience for fresh graduates, or individuals over 30. They also hesitate to hire those who frequently change jobs, preferring stability. Local candidates with drive are preferred, but they are wary of those demanding high salaries, whether it's 5,000 or 10,000. Marital status also plays a role, with concerns about wedding or maternity leaves. The reluctance to hire individuals over 35 stems from the perception of lower energy levels and increased family responsibilities. Ultimately, many jobs require basic skills, leading to a preference for hiring younger candidates who can be paid less. Gucci faces headwinds in Chinese market. Where does the luxury industry go from here? As China's economy faces challenges and consumers tighten their belts, concerns about slowed growth in the Chinese market are rising among luxury brands. Last week, iconic fashion luxury brand Gucci encountered headwinds in China, prompting further considerations for luxury businesses about their future direction. These business insights indicate that the expected surge in consumption from wealthy individuals in China following the end of the Chinese Communist Party's zero-tolerance policy has not materialized. Rising unemployment rates and a sluggish real estate market have dampened consumer confidence, while deflationary pressures have intensified concerns about growth in the Chinese consumer market, ultimately forcing luxury brands, including Kering SA, to reconsider how they conduct business in China. The bar for attracting Chinese consumers has also been raised, with some consumers disapproving of Gucci's new designs. A source familiar with the matter, who requested anonymity due to discussing sensitive issues, told Bloomberg that Gucci's online sales in China have significantly declined in recent months, including sales on its official website and the Tmall e-commerce platform. Tonight, I don't know what's going on, but business is slow, and there's nobody around. I just went out for a stroll, checked out some other shops, but they were all empty too. Then I looked at Meituan, and every nearby place was offering group discounts, except for mine. Managed to do a few orders in the afternoon, relying on lunchtime business. Where did everyone go? Maybe I should offer group discounts too? Just went out for another walk, and guess what? Rui Xing has closed so early. Where have all the people of this bustling Shanghai gone? The restaurant market environment in Shanghai feels like it couldn't get any worse. How's your place holding up? Regardless of severity, China's economic slowdown is impacting brands beyond Gucci.
A knowledgeable source informed Bloomberg that while top luxury brands like Rolex, Hermes, Chanel, and Louis Vuitton saw double-digit growth in popular destinations for Chinese shoppers such as Hong Kong in 2023, their sales began to slow down as early as October last year, with prices of second-hand luxury watches dropping by 40% compared to the same period last year. Back in the new century shopping plaza, there used to be so many people. It was bustling and crowded. But now, it's desolate. In addition to disappointing results in the Chinese market, luxury brands, led by Erwin Ramborg, a luxury goods analyst at HSBC Bank, stated in a report on Friday that the demand situation in China proves to be quite challenging. They further wrote that there is also a disappointing downturn in Hong Kong, Macau, and Singapore, as Chinese tourists, though numerous, seem to spend less. Some brands may be forced to find ways to reduce their reliance on China. A report by consulting firm Bain & Company predicts that the growth of luxury goods sales in China will slow to single digits this year, compared to a growth of 12% in 2023. Bruno Lons, co-author of the Bain Report, said that during uncertain times, Chinese consumers tend to prefer luxury goods that are easier to retain value. He said this is why brands owning such products outperform those launching seasonal brands. It's hard to believe unless you see it with your own eyes. Suzhou, once known for being bustling with economic strength and considered a paradise for laborers, is not as vibrant as it used to be. Despite its previous reputation, the number of people coming to Suzhou for work has decreased significantly in recent years. The streets are eerily quiet, with few people out and about, even for shopping. Normally, at this time of year, there would be crowds of people everywhere, dragging their luggage around. The area around job agencies used to be packed, but now there are more people looking to hire than those seeking jobs. The loss of migrant workers is severe, and the physical retail sector has taken a nosedive. It's really tough to deal with. What does the hot pot tourism reflect? The rise of hot pot tourism in Tianshui reflects the challenges faced by China's economy, particularly subdued consumption. Encouraging consumer spending, especially amid high unemployment rates, has long been a challenge for the authorities. The trend was ignited by online videos in early February, such as Tianshui Streetside Gansu Spicy Hot Pot, which gained significant traction. However, similar to the previous popularity of Zebo Barbecue, which led to individuals borrowing money to start their own businesses, the hot pot trend may face a similar fate, with a decline in tourists and closures of establishments after a short-lived period of success. Even as a small restaurant owner, I can sense that there's an issue with consumer spending in the market. People are reluctant to spend money. I don't know where everyone has gone in the past couple of years. Three sales reps came by early this morning to show me some liquor for my restaurant. I told them that as a small eatery, I don't need much. They should go to the supermarkets instead. One of them said the supermarkets were out of stock, so they had to come to me. Even the supermarket shelves are empty, and things aren't moving. I suggested they reduce their trips and come to our town instead. They said that if they don't meet their targets, their basic salary will be in jeopardy. It's tough to deal with them. I explained to them that my restaurant sells fewer items, unlike supermarkets. Also, I've been struggling to make sales lately. Not just them, even I feel like I'm spending less. People are avoiding unnecessary expenses and saving whatever they can. The harder it is to earn money, the more cautious they become about spending it. Before, I never used to shop on Pinduoduo, but now I find it quite convenient. Previously, my partner would drive to buy groceries, but now I insist they use an electric bike. We used to spend over a thousand yuan on clothes during seasonal changes, but now anything over 500 feels extravagant. We used to consider brand names when buying cosmetics, but now we're hunting for discounts and live streams. Before, we'd take taxis everywhere, but now we calculate which bus stop is closer to our destination. They say this phenomenon is called consumption downgrading. Chinese pig farming enterprises continue to incur losses. After three years of the pandemic, Chinese pig farming enterprises continue to incur losses. With last year's subdued consumption, pork prices have plummeted, leading to significant losses reported in recent performance reports by several pig farming giants. Additionally, several pig enterprises have proposed restructuring plans, potentially facing bankruptcy. Jiuxing Nongmu reported a net loss of $99.7 million last year. 
According to reports from China Securities Journal and Xinjing Bao, on March 22, Jixing Nomu released its 2023 annual report, revealing a net loss of $99.7 million last year, a decrease of 508.18% compared to the previous year. The main reason for the performance loss was attributed to an increase in the number of slaughtered pigs last year compared to the same period of the previous year, coupled with a decrease in the selling price of pigs, resulting in operating income growth being lower than operating cost growth. Further analysis of the annual report shows that in 2023, Jixing Nomu's gross profit margin was minus 0.37%, a decrease of 14.97 percentage points year-on-year, -year. net profit margin was minus 15.98%, a decrease of 20.05 percentage points from the previous year. Wins Food recorded a net loss of $980 million last year. According to a report by Securities Times, on February 27, Wins Food released its 2023 performance report, revealing a net loss of $980 million last year, compared to a net profit of $8.24 billion in the same period last year. The report indicated that in 2023, Wins Food sold 26.26 million pigs, a year-on-year -year increase of 46.65%, reaching a historical high. However, due to a significant year-on-year -year decline in the selling price of live pigs, the company's pig farming business suffered deep losses in profitability. In addition, in the chicken farming business, Wins Food sold 1.183 billion chickens last year, a year-on-year -year increase of 9.51%. However, due to a decrease in the average selling price of broilers, profitability in the chicken farming business also declined. Muyuan Food is expected to incur a net loss of up to $713.7 million last year. According to a performance forecast released by Muyuan Food, the main reason for the loss in 2023 was attributed to a significant decrease in pig prices compared to the previous year. Xian Xiang predicted a non-GAAP net loss of $6.99 billion last year. According to reports from the paper, Xianqiang Six Harmony Company, Limited released a performance forecast showing that in 2023, the net profit attributable to shareholders of listed companies is expected to be $46.58 million. However, after deducting non-recurring gains and losses, the net profit is expected to be a loss of $6.99 billion. Moreover, from 2021 to September 30, 2023, Xianqiang has accumulated losses of $2.318 billion, which offset the total profits from 2017 to 2020. Tianbang Food is facing bankruptcy due to inability to repay debts. On March 19, Tianbang Food, a listed pig farming company, announced its intention to apply to the court for company restructuring and pre-restructuring. The company stated that it is currently unable to repay its maturing debts and lacks solvency. However, the company believes it has restructuring value, aiming to increase capacity utilization and reduce the debt ratio through restructuring. Prior to Tianbang Food, other pig farming companies such as Jingbang Technology and Aonong Biology have also proposed restructuring plans. According to Jingbang Technologies' performance forecast, the net profit after deducting non-recurring gains and losses for 2023 is expected to be a loss of $776 million to $1.09 billion. Aonong Biology's performance forecast shows that the company is expected to incur a net loss of $465 million to $558 million in 2023. In recent years, the People's Republic of China has intensified its grip on the economic freedoms of both its citizens and foreign investors, implementing measures that drastically curtail individuals' ability to access their own money. In China, bank transfers require the owner of the account to be presented. An 80-year-old man with limited mobility was tied to a chair and carried into the bank. Because of this ridiculous requirement, many families must take their elders to the bank to withdraw money before they die. This tightening control manifests through a spate of regulations and restrictions, painting an increasingly bleak picture of financial autonomy within the nation. The implementation of these stringent controls reflects a broader trend of authoritarian oversight and highlights the Chinese government's prioritization of state control over individual liberty and market freedom. This dire situation was exacerbated by a series of high-profile system failures that crippled the operations of behemoth banks like the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, ICBC, and the China Construction Bank, CCB. In December 2022 alone, disruptions affected millions of customers who were left unable to access their accounts or conduct transactions, sowing seeds of distrust and tarnishing the bank's reputations. Compounding these woes is the sobering reality of declining profitability. The six largest Chinese banks collectively earned over 3.7 billion yuan, 
$537 million daily in the first half of 2022, but their profit growth rates have plummeted. The ICBC and CCB saw growth rates of just 5 to 6% in 2022, a stark contrast to the 18.7% growth achieved by one bank in 2021. The old man and the family passed away due to illness, leaving behind a deposit of $20,000 in the bank. However, his children went to the bank to withdraw their money but were refused and told that they were not eligible. What is the reason behind this? The $20,000 deposit is the hard-earned money saved by the elderly couple over the years from farming and collecting scrap. Even when they were sick, they didn't use it. But a few months ago, when the old man's condition worsened and he felt he might not last much longer, he called his children and asked them to go to the bank to withdraw the money. However, they encountered all sorts of difficulties. First, they were told that the system was under maintenance and they couldn't withdraw the money. Then, when the maintenance was completed, they were told that the system was facing error and they still couldn't withdraw. This went on until the old man passed away. After that, the bank straight up tells them that their request is impossible. The cause of the control could stand from the crisis of the Chinese banking industry. Data shows China's reserves fell to $3.053 trillion by September 2022, a $45 billion or 1.42% monthly decrease, the largest drop in seven months. With external debt ballooning to $2.4 trillion by June 2022, net reserves stood at just over $680 billion US dollars. What's the situation? This. What's the issue with these banknotes not being recognized? They should be recognized, they were all dispensed already. 27 of them cannot be recognized. What's going on? Please retrieve the banknotes that cannot be recognized. What? Still. It cannot be like this. So many. What's going on? Is all of this counterfeit money? Is it all counterfeit? Why is my salary all fake cash? Moreover, flooding markets with fake US dollars threatens the global reserve currency's stability. Experts warn if these bills enter circulation via China's central bank for settlement, it could trigger worldwide financial turmoil as the US aims to maintain its five treasures, military, US dollar dominance, multinationals, technology slash education. The implications are severe. Firstly, it corrodes citizens and the world's trust in Chinese banks managing financial assets. Numerous seizures by U.S. Customs illustrate the scale. Within three days in May 2021, officials intercepted 24 packages containing $685,000 in fake dollars from China. In April 2021, over 100 shipments totaling $1.64 million were seized, nearly all originating from China. Furthermore, according to recent data from the World Bank, China's banking sector is grappling with an escalating NPL issue. As of the end of the third quarter of 2023, the Chinese banking sector's NPL ratio stood at 1.65%, with outstanding NPLs reaching 4 trillion yuan or 546.72 billion US dollars, an increase of 183.2 billion yuan or roughly 25.5 billion US dollars from the beginning of the year. Furthermore, listed banks in China reported NPL volumes amounting to 2.13 trillion yuan or roughly 296 billion US dollars in 2023, a reflection of burgeoning credit risk within the sector. This uptick in NPLs is indicative of deteriorating asset quality and presents a systemic risk that could jeopardize the sector's stability. A man in his 70s suddenly fell ill and was rushed to the hospital. His brother, Mr. Jiang, arrived at the hospital only to find out that medication had been stopped due to late payment. He attempted to withdraw money using his brother's bank card but faced numerous obstacles at the bank. Eventually, Mr. Jiang negotiated with the bank to no avail. He suggested the bank directly coordinate with the hospital to expedite the transfer of life-saving funds. He stressed the urgency of the situation. Only after journalist intervention, the bank requested Mr. Jiang provide proof of kinship and have it notarized. Since Mr. Jiang's older brother had no children and was a loner, they sought assistance from the community center. The community center initially hesitated due to regulations prohibiting the issuance of proof of kinship for living relatives. However, they made an exception considering the urgency of the situation and obtained approval to issue the document. But the bank still says no. Starting in 2018, the Chinese government set a precedent for imposing harsh withdrawal limits for all citizens, begin with the introduction of a rule that restricted individuals from withdrawing more than 100,000 renminbi or about 15,530 US dollars annually from foreign countries. 
This measure, ostensibly aimed at curbing illicit financial flows and maintaining financial stability, has arguably had the dual effect of significantly limiting Chinese nationals' financial autonomy and their ability to participate freely in the global economy. Not only that, the CCP also restricted individual transfer, which caused a lot of anger. Do you understand the bank's actions here? How can the bank unilaterally breach the contract? So the maximum transfer limit is roughly 700 or 1,400 US dollars. You'll have to transfer again tomorrow. This questionable operation has caused great distress to many people. A nationwide movement against transfer limits is unfolding, impacting hundreds of millions. Previously, transferring 7,000 or 14,000 US dollars via mobile was simple, but now banks have capped the limits. If a friend lends you 28,000 US dollars, you'd need 20 years to transfer it all. When you urgently need 14,000 US dollars, the money is right there in your account, but you cannot access it. The banks claim these measures prevent telecommunication fraud. However, this one-size-fits-all approach has caused major inconveniences. Depositors have the right to freely access their funds, how can banks breach this unilaterally? While publicly citing fraud prevention, banks likely have ulterior motives. By limiting transfers, they can keep more deposits in their accounts to earn interest spreads. They also force customers to visit branches for paperwork, allowing dormant tellers to re-engage users using a seemingly justifiable pretext to serve their own interests, regardless of the inconvenience caused. Chinese central bank's recent measures to stimulate the economy amidst ongoing challenges such as the return of COVID-19 and internal financial pressures, it's evident that deeper concerns loom within China's financial system. The People's Bank of China, PBOC's decision to slash the reserve requirement ratio, RRR, for banks by 50 basis points as of February 5, freeing up a substantial 1 trillion yuan or 139.8 billion US dollars in long-term capital, was positioned as a boost to the struggling economy. While this action ostensibly aims to spur lending and invigorate economic activities, it inadvertently paints a picture of a system grappling with liquidity fears and wavering investor confidence. If the ability to deposit and withdraw money freely disappears, then what is the meaning of earning money? Recently, a vigorous movement to limit transfers is spreading nationwide, with individual account limits ranging from 700 or 1,400 US dollars. What about the national economy? Recently, I applied for a bank card, but it said that only counter withdrawals are allowed, and non counter transactions are prohibited. Moreover, it's only possible to apply for non counter transactions after three months, and you have to go to the Public Security Bureau's anti fraud center in advance to get approval. The daily online transfer limit is also not granted, said to be part of a card-cutting operation. In the future, borrowing and repaying money might require pooling funds from several banks, which is very troublesome. This is one thing, but what if a family member gets sick and needs urgent money for hospitalization? What should we do then? This financial maneuvering arrives amidst an environment of restrictive capital controls that not only affects domestic financial operations, but also how China approaches foreign investments and manages expatriate finances. Despite the semblance of adopting a more open stance towards foreign investments, with cities like Shanghai and Beijing purportedly easing access to funds for foreigners, the reality remains starkly contrasting. The existence of such liberal zones is dwarfed by the extensive web of stringent restrictions and capital controls that prevail nationwide. Chinese banks are the epitome of favoring the rich and powerful while bullying the weak and fearing the strong. State-owned enterprises, SOEs, and central enterprises struggle to borrow money from them. Every day, various documents claim to support small and micro loans, but in reality, it's difficult. If SOEs and central enterprises lend money to each other and end up with bad debts, what happens? What if they lend to private enterprises, and they default? What if they don't repay? The heads of banks are on the line, so there's no choice. This is the reality where the position determines the outcome. The tightening noose of financial repression is further evidenced by reports from Hong Kong, where residents face increasing hurdles in withdrawing funds on the mainland. Instances of extended waiting periods spanning several hours and augmented security measures around banking facilities are not uncommon, planting seeds of concern regarding the economy's stability and a palpable government paranoia over potential capital outflow. The scenario in Hong Kong epitomizes a growing trend of enhanced surveillance and control, igniting fears among the populace and international observers alike. Revealing the insider dealings of a banking system involves the top executives of the bank, such as the CEO and others. 
They engage in various schemes to make money, with one lucrative method being clandestine loan operations. Through third-party institutions, they seek out borrowers, often referred to colloquially as finding pigs, wherein various assets like houses, cars, and companies are bundled together. These third-party institutions collude with the bank's executives to swiftly acquire funds, leaving the borrower with minimal or even no money while burdened with significant debt. Don't be skeptical about the involvement of bank executives. Incidents of their involvement periodically come to light. Have any high-ranking bank executives been caught? In the face of monetary temptations, is there anything they wouldn't dare to do? When I mention the amounts they could pocket, you will be surprised. It's not just tens or hundreds of thousands, that's petty cash for them. The sums involved are in the tens of millions to billions. The implications are staggering, an entire generation's life savings, pensions, and financial futures held hostage by a cabal of untouchable elites who treat the nation's wealth as their personal slush fund. As the last vestiges of transparency erode, and financial freedoms dwindle to a mere facade, the once unthinkable question looms, has China's banking system become little more than a grand Ponzi scheme, sustained by draconian capital controls and the blind faith of its citizens? Foreign capital has been steadily pulling out. Despite China unilaterally lifting visa restrictions on several countries, it has not only failed to draw a surge of foreigners into the country, but has also witnessed a gradual decline in the number of foreigners who were previously residing in the country. This might be causing genuine concern for Xi Jinping. In recent months, China has streamlined visa procedures for business travelers and tourists, reduced visa fees, and even introduced visa waivers for select countries. Additionally, China has maintained its favorable tax policies to make living in China more appealing for foreign nationals. Physical stores are empty, wholesale markets are deserted, and even live streaming platforms have no viewers. So where has everyone gone? Many Chinese colleagues in the industry, whether veterans or newcomers, have never experienced such a disastrous march in the year 2024. It's truly unprecedented. Consumer spending on the mainland is simply appalling. We've interviewed many friends in the clothing industry, and they all feel helpless and miserable. They call this March of 2024 the Dark March, a catastrophe never seen before in this century. Even during the pandemic, when people were confined to their homes, things weren't this bad. Even the traditionally slow months like July and August were better than now. Clearly, you can feel that there are problems in the market. In over a decade, the banks haven't faced a situation like this year's. Now, if you randomly ask someone on the street, they all feel that there's an issue with the current market. People are reluctant to spend money, malls are empty, and markets are constantly closing down. Many storefronts are vacant, and even when available, they struggle to find tenants. Where have all these consumers gone? Over the past couple of years, the crowded shopping scenes have become rare. It seems like many people aren't keen on shopping or spending money anymore. They save wherever they can, and when they do have money, they prefer to save it rather than spend it, especially as earning becomes more difficult. In the past, many middle-class individuals looked down on platforms like Pinduoduo and never bought anything from there. But now, many companies are rallying together privately, asking each other to help negotiate prices. Previously, many people found this distasteful, but now they not only accept it but also see it as a good thing. Many used to take taxis everywhere but now they've gotten used to taking public transportation. On the surface, it seems like there's nobody left, but the real feeling is that people just don't have money anymore. The poor performance of businesses and large-scale layoffs in the internet industry directly translate to pay cuts. Now, in supermarkets, vegetables and fruits are no longer priced by the kilogram. From what I remember, watermelons used to be sold by weight. A few days ago, I saw watermelons in the supermarket priced at over 83 cents per kilogram. You heard that right, over 83 cents for a small watermelon, which is outrageous. Many people can't afford watermelons anymore. In mainland China, 674 is considered expensive. These middle-class individuals earn just over $691 a month, averaging only a little over $13 a day. Now, if you go to the market to buy things or dine out, $13 simply isn't enough. So, this is the current situation. This is the market situation after the resumption of work. Is it difficult or not? It's difficult, yet we still have to pay fees. Today, I haven't even made $26 in sales. What national style, what style? Aren't they all nonsense? No matter what style it is, it can't withstand the market. 
If the market isn't strong, even the wind won't help. It's useless. Can everyone understand this year's business? Isn't it supposed to get busier after the resumption of work? Why are there fewer and fewer people? Hey, I haven't experienced such a market in spring for over a decade. Usually, what I experience is the market where everyone is using Bluetooth to wake up. Now, things are unclear. But I believe people have to eat, and they have to wear clothes. This is essential. Clothing is definitely eternal, the industry cannot do without clothes. With so many people in China, fellow traders, have I given you enough encouragement? Now, we feel powerless. No matter how much we adjust or innovate, there are no customers. It's utterly disheartening. In the past, if sales were slow, we could change styles or adjust prices, and business would improve. But now, no matter what we do, there's no one buying. How can we manage in such a situation? Some may hear optimistic predictions and think things will improve in the summer, but the reality is harsh. Even when summer arrives, the situation will likely remain the same. Maybe things will slightly improve in the fall and winter, but the first half of this year is essentially a write-off. This isn't fear-mongering, it's the reality we're facing. Feishu, a software office system under ByteDance, is reportedly conducting a large-scale layoff, affecting approximately 20% of its workforce, which will impact thousands of employees. In a report by the paper in Saishin, on March 26, the employees of Feishu received a company-wide message. In the message, the company stated, due to issues such as large team size, insufficient organization efficiency, decreased productivity, and lack of focus, the company has decided to make some adjustments and appropriately streamline the team size. Feishu peaked at 6,000 to 8,000 employees in 2022. On March 26 of this month, an informed source told 21st Century Economic Report that Feishu currently has about 5,000 employees, and the layoff ratio this time is 20%. For employees who are laid off, Feishu has provided compensation plans and job transfer opportunities. ByteDance Feishu officially announced. The layoffs are expected to affect a thousand people, as a company that promotes corporate office efficiency begins to address its own office efficiency issues. This round of layoffs has a unique and difficult to decipher significance, completely changing the algorithm for layoffs that was previously exclusive to the entire network. Previously, the so-called strategic and business announcements made by major companies during good economic times, which we believe to be the safest job prospects, are no longer secure. Feishu initially served as an internal communication tool for ByteDance. Since 2012, ByteDance has used various domestic and foreign office applications such as Skype, WeChat and WeChat Enterprise, Slack, and DingTalk. At the end of 2016, it decided to develop its own, and at the end of 2017, ByteDance began to use Feishu comprehensively, and it was officially open to the industry in 2019. In November 2021, ByteDance CEO Zhang Yiming announced the establishment of six business segments, namely Douyin, Dili Education, Feishu, Volcano Engine, Chaos Sinuan, and TikTok. Feishu's layoff of 20% can be seen how bad the IT environment is this year. So how should we deal with it? Hello everyone, I'm a programmer, and today I want to share with you a recent hot topic in the IT industry, which is Feishu's layoff of 20%. They actually have about 5,000 employees in total, which means they are going to lay off around 1,000 people. According to internal sources, because I'd previously interviewed at Feishu through a referral from a colleague's classmate, he said their department indeed had such a layoff. At that time, I felt quite good during the interview, but they said they wouldn't consider me because there was already a candidate in the group who had a similar experience. Of course, I don't deny that there might be some issues with my skills, but it might also be due to the impact of this layoff. I had my interview two weeks ago, and about this layoff, I feel like the IT environment in 2024 is really tough. According to Interface News, starting from 2022, business lines such as Feishu and TikTok have received layoff notices. At the same time, Tencent has also reported layoffs. On March 27, a netizen posted a message on a workplace content community stating that according to internal messages from relevant employees, a certain major company has begun layoffs, with a layoff ratio of 10% to 30%. According to the Southern Metropolis Daily Report, the PCG and CSIG business groups mentioned in the message are all business groups under Tencent. However, Tencent insiders pointed out that the message was not true. However, Tencent has previously reported layoffs several times. According to reports from Fast Technology, 
Tencent's Q1 2023 financial report shows that as of March 31, 2022, Tencent had 116,213 employees. As of December 31, 2022, this number was 108,436, and as of March 31, 2023, this number dropped to 106,221. From the data, from March 31, 2022 to March 31, 2023, Tencent reduced its workforce by almost exactly 10,000 employees, a decrease of 8.6%. Pei Minxin, a professor of Chinese politics and issues, said that the Chinese government can reduce the alienation of Sino-Western relations by stabilizing the geopolitical tensions involving the country. However, considering the recent trend of economic decoupling, it is unlikely that the situation of talent outflow will be reversed. It's not just foreign business executives and tourists who feel that China has lost its charm. Even students from developed countries don't want to study in China anymore. Diplomats analyzed why China is no longer attractive to foreign students. According to a report by the People's Political Consultative Conference held this month, Professor Jia Qinghua of Peking University pointed out that the policies related to the study in China brand promoted by Xi Jinping seem to have not produced substantive results. The number of international students studying in China, especially from the United States, has decreased from its peak of about 15,000 students 10 years ago to about 350 students in 2023. Why has the number of international students decreased? Jia Qinghua listed three possible reasons. First is the perception issue. In short, foreign students generally believe that studying in China is not very meaningful. Additionally, obtaining funding from the Chinese Ministry of Education for studying in China is not only difficult, but also potentially dangerous. The second reason is that foreign companies have reduced their business operations in China due to the deterioration of the Chinese economy. This means that internships or similar opportunities for foreign students have decreased. The third reason is the ideological factor in China. There is increasing uncertainty about the anonymous review of papers written by foreign students. Additionally, the lack of detailed implementation guidelines for China's espionage law has made the standards for illegality unclear, leading to misunderstandings in China. It is currently unclear whether students from developed countries will choose to study in China again. If the Chinese government believes that despite crackdowns, foreigners and funds will still be attracted to China, then reality proves this wrong. Recently, Japanese media Kyoto News reported that a Chinese professor teaching at Kobe University in Japan disappeared after returning to Beijing in early March to visit family. At this moment, the number of people disappearing in China for reasons of national security, including those of foreign nationality, is increasing. Coupled with the decline in the Chinese economy, despite Xi Jinping's personal involvement, who dares to enter China either as a foreigner or with foreign funds? While Xi Jinping meets multinational CEOs in Beijing, in Hong Kong, 23 new measures are rapidly enacted, reflecting the characteristic mix of both CCP and Xi Jinping styles. However, for foreign businesses and investments that prioritize certainty, this creates uncertainty. At this moment, Hong Kong resembles Nanjing in 1949, with the Yangtze River surging, whether to stay or leave, becomes a question. Firstly, the Wall Street Journal observes the impact of the 23 measures from the perspective of Hong Kongers. The headline reads, Bookstores closed, shows cancelled, Hong Kong descends into sad silence. The report indicates that with China's authoritarian rule tightening its grip on this once bustling metropolis, every corner of society is affected. Bookstores are closing, shows are being cancelled, and the once rallying voices against the government now whisper behind closed doors. The recently enacted 23 measures impose harsher penalties for incitement-related offenses and introduce new charges related to state secrets and foreign interference. This legislation, swiftly passed by the Hong Kong Legislative Council with the approval of the Chinese government, has sparked debates about whether people will get into trouble for minor offenses. For instance, some wonder if keeping old pro-democracy newspapers scattered around the house might lead to trouble. The vice chairman of the Social Democratic Alliance, Chao Ka Fai, remarked that as more unwritten rules emerge, citizens become increasingly unsure of how to behave, forced to silently bear the burden. The Social Democratic Alliance is one of the few remaining pro-democracy groups in Hong Kong. The police have urged taxi drivers to report anyone they suspect of being involved in violence, terrorism, or other crimes. They have also established a hotline for reporting national security-related information, receiving hundreds of thousands of messages so far. 
Several independent bookstores renowned for supporting freedom of speech have stated that they are subjected to frequent government inspections regarding various matters, including land use regulations and the clear display of business licenses. In the Hong Kong art scene, a series of dance and theater performances have been cancelled by organizers or venues, sometimes without explanation. Members participating in these performances are well-known pro-democracy activists in Hong Kong. Public funding for Hong Kong's oldest theater awards has also been reduced. The Financial Times analyzed how the 23 measures have affected the confidence of foreign businesspeople in Hong Kong. The report stated that in Hong Kong, the US-based law firm Reed Smith is preventing its lawyers from using international databases. Deloitte and KPMG require employees to carry disposable phones when visiting Hong Kong. Several other multinational companies are discussing whether to take similar measures. A consultant based in Hong Kong stated, there are so many uncertainties now. People are unsure what actions carry risks. In terms of data security, is Hong Kong considered part of China? No one knows. The recently enacted 23 measures aim to expand the definition of state secrets, including data related to the economic, social, or technological developments of Hong Kong or mainland China. A senior foreign banker remarked, in the past, people like me who were completely indifferent to politics always felt completely safe. I thought they would leave me alone because I wasn't involved in any political activities. But now I'm not so sure. Many companies in Hong Kong conduct due diligence. If one of them annoys someone, what will be the consequences? Recently, bankers have been asking whether foreign nationals in Hong Kong will face travel bans, similar to what some executives experience on the Chinese mainland, especially if they handle sensitive information about Chinese companies and due diligence projects. Stephen Roach, former chairman of Morgan Stanley Asia, wrote in an article for the Financial Times, Hong Kong is finished, and it saddens us. It took only a few years to destroy the Oriental Pearl built over a century. The 23 measures are the last straw that broke Hong Kong's back and probably the final blow to the confidence of foreign businesses and investments in China. Will foreign businesses buy into it? Leave your comments in the section below.